Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. It is my pleasure to present to you the president of this college, Dr. Axel Steuer. Sir? On behalf of everyone at Gustavus Adolphus College, I welcome all of you to the second day of the 27th Annual Nobel Conference. We began our exploration of the evolving cosmos yesterday, and if that program was a good indicator, we have another intellectually stimulating and very enjoyable day in store for us. Our distinguished speakers will once again surely see to that. At this time, it is a particular honor and pleasure to welcome to the platform Nobel laureate Dr. William A. Fowler for the conferring of the honorary degree from Gustavus Adolphus College. May I ask the Dean of the College, Dr. Tim Robinson, to bring forward members of the honorary degree party. It's a tradition at the college to confer honorary degrees upon Nobel laureates who visit the campus. Today, Dr. William Fowler, physicist, rock tour, aficionado of the music of Robert Schumann, <laughs> will become the 67th Nobel laureate to be so honored. On behalf of the faculty of Gustavus Adolphus College, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Richard Fuller, professor of physics and chairman of this conference, to read the citation for Dr. Fowler. Mr. President, today we honor Dr. William A. Fowler, Emeritus Professor of Physics and Astrophysics from California Institute of Technology. Dr. Fowler was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1911 and grew up in Lima, Ohio. His early activities show that he possessed a curiosity about the world around him that was going to serve him well in his life as a scientist and teacher. He received his undergraduate education in engineering physics from Ohio State University. He received his graduate training and a PhD in physics from California Institute of Technology. His PhD thesis was on radioactive elements of low atomic number. In World War II, Dr. Fowler began working on the grand concept of nucleosynthesis that was put forth by Fred Hoyle. This work involved the team of Dr. Fowler, Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage, and Fred Hoyle, a most prestigious list of astrophysicists. Their work culminated in a paper, Synthesis of the Elements in Stars where they showed that all of the elements starting with hydrogen and helium could be produced by the nuclear processes in stars. It is for his pioneering work in nucleosynthesis that Dr. Fowler was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1983. In addition to his contributions to his own research, Dr. Fowler has provided us with his students, his grandstudents, and his grand-grandstudents, who are among the most active scholars, teachers, and contributors in astrophysics today. Dr. Fowler has received awards from institutions in many countries throughout the world. He has received honorary degrees from nine colleges and universities and honors from over a dozen national societies. His diverse interests and curiosities are reflected in his memberships, awards, and elected offices. They include memberships in the American Baseball Research Society, president of the American Physical Society, honorary member of the Mark Twain Society, and Benjamin Franklin Fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts. Dr. William A. Fowler is an inspiration for all of us who call ourselves teachers. He is an excellent model of the teacher-scholar that serves te teachers well wherever they work. President Stoyer, it is my pleasure to present to you, upon recommendation of the faculty of Gustavus Adolphus College, Dr. William A. Fowler for the degree of o Doctor of Science honoris causa. On the recommendation of the faculty and with approval of the Gustavus Adolphus College Board of Trustees, and by virtue of the authority vested in this institution by the state of Minnesota, I hereby confer upon you, William A. Fowler, the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereunto appertaining. Well, 
it's a great pleasure for me to receive this honorary degree from Gustavus Adolphus College. It's an honor which I will always hold in very high esteem. And I'm most grateful and I want to thank the faculty and trustees of Gustavus Adolphus for this great honor, which I shall always hold, as I said, in high esteem. Thank you. It is my pleasure now to present to you my colleague, Dr. Tom Huber from the Physics Department, who introduced Dr. Fowler for his lecture. Dr. Fowler has spent his career bringing the study of the universe into the lab. He and his colleagues have made accelerators, instruments which measure the same reactions which occur at the heart of the stars and the origin of the universe. The monumental work, Synthesis of the Elements in Stars, written in 1957, explained that stars could produce all elements. This work is cited so frequently that it is often just called B squared FH, after the initials of the authors, Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage, William Fowler and Fred Hoyle. Within several years after this paper, it became clear that the observed abundances of light elements in the universe could not be accounted for by stellar reactions. In 1967, he again teamed up with, Fowl with Hoyle and was joined by Robert Wagoner in producing another seminal work on the synthesis of elements at very high temperature. It not only solved the problem of abundance of light elements, but it split, placed stringent constraints on the conditions of the universe just minutes after the Big Bang. These and his other numerous papers are strongly based on the relationship between laboratory nuclear physics and measurements of stellar reaction rates. He's continued these investigations to the present. Most recently he has been studying the implications of the inflationary universe model and observation of healthy elements in some of the earliest stars. Today's talk, Early no Nucleosynthesis in an Inhomogeneous Universe, is based on this research. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. William Fowler. Is mine. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Tom. Tom, this is water. I thought you, I thought you said it was going to be gin. It'd be a lot better talk if it were.
My Nobel lecture in 1983 addressed the question of the quest for the origin of the chemical elements in our observable universe. Quite simply, it was argued that isotopes of hydrogen and helium were produced from protons and neutrons in a homogeneous and is isotopic, isotropic early universe commonly called the Big Bang, while still heavier elements and their isotopes were synthesized from the primordial hydrogen and helium by nuclear processes in stars, novae, and supernovae. It is still believed that the great majority of the elements beyond helium are produced in these astrophysical circumstances. However, since the suggestion by Alan Guth in 1981 that our early universe experienced an enormous growth in size or inflation, it has come to be believed that a small fraction of the heavy elements were produced shortly after this inflation. This explained, among other things, why the earliest, oldest stars observed by astronomers show evidence for small but si significant amounts of heavy elements in their spectra, which could not have been made in stars because there weren't any previous ones to, to these older ones, oldest ones. Now, studies of this new development was greatly enhanced when Edward Witten, in 1984, showed that the universe, after inflation, would be inhomogeneous rather than homogeneous. Our observable universe, expanding as Edwin Hubble found from his redshift measurements in the 1920s, could be thought of as an expanding bubble of matter as we know it, matter as we know it, into an otherwise steady state universe consisting of extremely high density stuff called vacuum matter for want of a better term. This vacuum matter corresponded, corresponded to Einstein's cosmological constant and to Friedman's, Friedman's cosmological term in his equations governing the expansion of our observable universe with a finite but rapidly increasing radius. Remarkably enough, this vacuum matter exerted negative pressure and thus can be thought of as the cause of our expanding bubble. Now, as I've noticed previously, the matter in our expanding bubble was inhomogeneous. An early quark gluon plasma transformed into a hadron gas consisting ultimately of high density proton rich regions immersed in a neutron rich sea. Nucleus synthesis in the neutron rich sea permitted highly charged heavy nuclei to be synthesized since neutrons are neutral with zero electric charge. Coulomb repulsion prevents charged protons and alpha particles from amalgamating with highly charged nuclei. There is no Coulomb repulsion for neutrons. Many authors, including myself and my collaborators, have contributed to what is by now a fairly clear picture of nucleosynthesis in the inhomogeneous universe. Experimentalists have studied in the laboratory some of the many additional nuclear reactions which took place in the neutron-rich sea, also rich in deuterium, tritium, and helium-4. This past decade has been a very exciting one in contributing to our knowledge of the early history of the universe you and I inhabit. There's still more to be done, and that is mainly what I will talk about as I go to, to my slides. Before I go to my slides, which are going to be rather dull, I'm afraid, uh, let me tell you a story, which I think is appropriate to tell at Gustavus Adolphus College. It's about a priest and a member of his congregation whom I will call a practitioner. And the priest and the practitioner went to play golf around the golf one day. And they got to the first uh, hole, and the priest teed up his ball and took a great swing at it and missed it completely. He says, God damn it, I missed. And the pra 
practitioner rushed up to him and he says, Father, and should you be using such words even on the golf course? And the priest just, just, just shook his head. They went on to the second hole. The priest teed up the golf ball, swung again, and the same thing happened. And he said, God damn it, I missed. And the heavens opened, and a great roll of thunder and a lightning bolt came down and struck the practitioner dead. <laughs> and a great voice from heaven said, God damn it, I missed. <laughs> We'll go to the slides now. <laughs> Who in heaven's name is that? <laughs> Let's see, what do I do here? <laughs> there we are. inflationary universe, which I'll be talking about. For those of you who are interested in really reading the, one of the basic articles, Guth's first article was had some errors in it, and they were all cleared out by Guth and Paul Steinhardt in an article in the Scientific American in 1984. And the whole point is that the early universe before inflation was very small, with all parts in causal contact and thus at the same temperature. That led to the fact that the cosmic background radiation is at the same temperature everywhere today as observed to better than one part in 10 to the fourth. We see previously in our early ideas of the, of the Big Bang, we really had no way of knowing about the constancy of the cosmic background radiation, but when you start out with something small enough that was all in causal contact, then thermal equilibrium was established, and that was continued during uh, the expansion. Uh, the early uh, exponential expansion, uh, early, I mean around 10 to the minus 32 seconds, led to a flat Euclidean universe with, with a curvature parameter, which appears in Friedman's equations, uh, thus going to zero. I'll show you a slide, but if you expand something enough, uh, like a sphere, and look at the uh, at the curves of uh, of uh, the curves of longitude on it, uh, at first they all look like they're curving so. But if you expand the sphere and look at just a very small part, the lines get closer and closer together, and the curvature, which is described by the constant k in the Friedman equations that goes to zero. And that's one of the uh, basic things that come out of inflation. And I've always liked it because it makes, uh, makes Friedman's equations uh, much easier to solve than when you have a positive or a negative k. Uh, then there's going to be a universal expansion rate I'll be talking about in which we'll take a is some distant scale factor, and Hubble's constant squared is uh, equal to the time derivative of A divided by A squared, and then Friedman's equation, or Einstein's equation if you wish, says that's equal to 8 pi g, the gravitational constant over 3, times the average density in, in the universe if you're talking on a large enough scale plus the cosmological constant, which for some reason or other, uh, Einstein and Friedman divided by a, f a factor of three. And then there's this cosmological constant term, uh, I mean the curvature parameter term here, which you see introduces a factor of one over a squared, which just makes this differential equation miserable. So with k equals zero, you get rid of this. And in fact, if you can get the cosmological constant to go to zero, you can get rid of that term. But before we do that, we can uh, 
we can take the lambda uh, by an appropriate definition of a constant vacuum density, which as I said we use uh, for lack of a better term, if we define it as lambda over 8 pi g, you've already got the 3, then you see you can write that a dot over a squared, Hubble's constant squared is 8 pi g over 3 times rho, the real matter density, plus this so-called vacuum matter. And the real matter density, let me tell you, goes as 1 over a cubed. We all know that. Uh, so it goes to zero in a vacuum. Uh, but the rate, and of course the radiation density in the universe goes as 1 over a to the fourth. So it's small now. And then we have this rho sub v. And one can define a critical density, which is uh, equal to 3h squared over 8 pi g which just makes a dot over a equal to, uh, uh, equal to unity. When you, if you put that value of the critical density in here. Well, I told you these slides were going to be boring. Well, we have to go on with it. Uh, uh, you can define some dimensionless parameters by dividing by this critical density. And uh, then you get uh, uh, a thing that's called omega in the literature, 8 pi g over 3h squared. That's the critical density. In, well, 3h squared over 8 pi g is the critical density. Divide that into rho, and you get what we call omega. The ratio of the true density, mean density throughout our observable universe to this critical density. And then you can define a lambda, a lowercase lambda, uh, in terms of this vacuum density. And it turns out just to be the capital lambda over 3h squared. Or you can put it into uh, a term that looks very much like the term here. So now uh, the flat universe relation, that equation with k equals 0, if you, if you think about it, uh, means that omega plus lambda is just equal to unity. And thus, omega will be unity if, if the cosmological constant term is zero. And however, even then, there's the problem. This omega, which has to cover all of the matter in the universe, uh, can consist of baryons, stuff like you and me, plus the various kinds of exotic particles, neutrinos, photinos, axions, I guess Higgs boson, so forth on down the line. Now, from the Big Bang production of deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, and lithium-7, in the old homogeneous universe, one got that omega baryon was 0.1. And so the exotic omega, and Phil Morrison described that beautifully yesterday, had to be around 9 tenths. And that was known from 1967. And then the question comes, what are the exotic particles. And uh, I've never liked exotic particles. I have enough exotic things in my life without having particles that are exotic. And so uh, could a mega baryon be one? And my answer, and that of other people, which came out around 1987, is yes. Now, I want to explain, particularly to the students here, that not everyone in the field uh, in astronomy and astrophysics agrees with, with me about this. And uh, all I can uh, uh, do is point that out. And uh, uh, you'll just have to, you'll just have to read what these stupid people write uh, uh, in order to find the other side of the case. So here is the, what the expansion does, as I said, to a, you start with a, a sphere in which you see the, uh, see the longitude lines here. Uh, they're all curved. Now expand the sphere, expand it, and just start looking at a little section over here. And after some expansion, that section over here will look like that. And if you expand it enough, 
all the lines become parallel and thus the curvature uh, term has been reduced to zero. There's no curvature here in the coordinate lines. So that's one of the great things about inflation that the curvature term, which is such a miserable thing in Friedman's equation, uh, goes to zero. Well, more about the inflationary universe. You know, uh, wonderful thing, uh, both in classical mechanics and in general relativity, the total energy uh, of the universe, or of anything for that matter, is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And the kinetic energy is just one half mass times the, times the velocity squared, and the potential energy is the gravitational constant times any mass squared over, over, the, over the separation distance. And uh, you can show that that's, if you go through that equations back there, that's about six-fifths of k times mc squared. And notice it goes to zero if k is zero, so all you have is the, uh, is the kinetic plus potential plus equal to the total energy is zero. And as a nuclear physicist who uh, has worked in a who worked for many years in a nuclear lab, we based everything we did on the conservation uh, conservation of mass energy. That was a dictum, which when we studied our nuclear reactions, we had to have the same amount of energy in the masses of the nuclear particles that was transformed into kinetic energy. The conservation of energy was uh, was followed, and so you see with K equals zero, uh, you get that the total energy uh, in the universe is zero, and that has always pleased me that uh, this general picture, the conservation of energy, uh, is observed. So inflation reduces the curvature parameter to zero, and thus the total energy of the observable, of the observable universe is zero. Energy is conserved in the universe that we inhabit. There's no problem in the conservation of energy in, in the expansion after inflation. The expansion of the universe uh, follows the conservation of energy, or is driven by the conservation of energy. Well, other, con other consequences of the of the inflationary model. Uh, first of all, I've tried to convince you that the total energy of the universe is equal to zero. The rest mass energy plus the kinetic energy of expansion minus the gravitational potential energy is zero. And then you can show, if you again go back to Friedman's equations, that time in the universe is governed by a relation between the age of the universe and the Hubble time. The Hubble time is, uh, you know, we usually speak of, uh, of uh, I mean, of velocity being proportional to distance. Well, if you bring the distance over on the, on the side where the velocity is, distance divided by, or velocity divided by, by the distance is time, and that we call the Hubble time, and that time which you can measure from Hubble's constant, uh, is related under these consequences to the age of the universe by the factor two-thirds. Now there again is where there's a great deal of controversy, and I think this is true, and many of my colleagues uh, who uh, have worked on the problem think it's true, but I want to emphasize that there are, there are skeptics uh, who uh, would challenge uh, even this simple relation. Well, let's ha look at a possible scenario based on the inflationary model. And I want to say this is oversimplified. You can't, uh, you can't put on a slide all of the complications that um, probably exist in nature. Uh, that's not the United States, that's us. And we think we're at the center of things, 
and we can look back as we look out in distance we look back in time and we can look back to the period when the uh, uh, when the universe was opaque and it was after that period when, uh, it was at that the end of that period that the source of the black body radiation uh, uh, occurred it started out way back then at about four about 4,000 degrees Kelvin, and now due to expansion, you know when you expand uh, any gas, it cools, it's come down to 2.7 degrees Kelvin as is accurately measured. Now, the observable horizon, which is a, a constant, which is the velocity of light times the uh, 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 times the Hubble time, uh, well, I've given the relation there, the true horizon can be much larger. And in fact, if you want to dream a bit, you can think that maybe there are other universes uh, immersed in uh, all of this stuff in between, mass and energy of the false vacuum, which is equivalent to a large cosmological constant. See, it obeys Einstein's equation, or Friedman's equation, no question about that. It just has a large cosmological constant. And what we hope is that here around, right around us, that the cosmological constant uh, is zero. So that's a possible scenario. Oh, and by the way, these other universes have to be much further away than I'm able to show on this diagram, because in the 10, 12, 13 billion years of the age of the universe, we don't want these things overlapping, uh, because uh, that would be a a really spectacular, uh, spectacular event, and not only for us, but for them. Well, I think I must list or just show you that there are quite a few references. Uh, uh, Witten, in my book, started it all. Well, Guth, if you, and Steinhardt but I had there, and uh, uh, Matthews was a postdoc of mine. He's written things on it. Uh, I mean, Applegate spent some time with me, and he's been, uh, George Fuller was my uh, uh, 49th graduate student, and then Bob Mullaney uh, was a postdoc with me for several years. He's now at Livermore, and there is a kind of a summary statement that I wrote for the Cambridge University Press in 1989. But anyhow, what it all boils down to is that pronounced nonlinear baryon density fluctuations produced in the early quark hadron phase transition. You know, we're baryons, which are a type of hadron, type of hadron. And baryons, each baryon is made up of three quarks. So in the very beginning, uh, the temperatures were so high that the protons and neutrons were broken down into their constituent particles, the quarks. And as things cooled, you had a quark-hadron phase transition. Three quarks got together to make hadrons. The hadrons, uh, there, are some, there are some heavier ones than the baryons, that gradually emitted gamma rays and, or uh, various other things and came down to the baryons, which is the stuff like us. We're the we're the lowest energy uh, type of the hadrons. But anyhow, the early quark hadron phase transit makes nuclear synthesis in a closed baryonic universe in fair agreement with observations on the primordial abundances of deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, lithium-7, beryllium-9, and a small amount of uh, the elements with atomic number greater than 12. And the key is that the baryon density fluctuations lead to a neutron-rich region in which part of the, of, the, of the Big Bang synthesis takes place. In the neutron-rich region, you don't have Coulomb repulsion, so you can go to, to more heavily charged nuclei and produce ones with atomic number greater than 12. In fact, you can go all the way up to uranium and thorium. But only a very, very small amount is made at this stage 
those who follow my line of thought think that that is where the small amount of heavy elements that astronomers see in the, in the very oldest stars, stars in the oldest galaxies, uh, where, where it came from. Well, going along with what Mulaney uh, did with, with me looking over his shoulder, more or less, uh, we decided we'd like to see if we could make Big Bang nucleosynthesis not only with omega equal to one, but with the omega being made up of baryons. So omega B is one. And so following the quark hadron phase transition occurred about 10 to the minus four seconds, we had high density regions. Here they are, proton rich. They were much like uh, the whole universe, in the homogeneous universe, there are about six times as many protons as neutrons. That's because neutrons are heavier uh, than protons. So uh, when you write down the uh, probability or the ratio of protons to neutrons, there's an exponential term that contains the, the mass difference to a negative power. And so protons turn out to be six to seven times as uh, probable as neutrons. And that's what's in these bubbles where all the matter started. But then neutrons diffuse much faster than protons. When a proton starts to move, it bumps into another charge and gets scattered. Neutrons aren't scattered by charges, so they, they waffle around. Finally, they came out, and they produce a low-density region, which is neutron-rich, which surrounds the, uh, these proton-rich bubbles and there's a different nucleosynthesis in the two regions. And you not only get the primordial abundances of deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, and also lithium-7, uh, if back diffusion of neutrons destroys beryllium-7 in P-rich regions, I'll say a little bit more about that. But the most important thing is also a small amount of heavy elements, mostly from A equals 12 up to about 60, and you make what we call R process nuclei, because there's an R process in the old R process in the old uh, 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 stellar synthesis scheme. It means the R is for rapid, rapid neutron capture, and the R process nuclei in, uh, c can be produced in first generation stars, and the neutrons will run you all the way up to thorium and uranium. And then you get fission. And out of that fission, you get two C nuclei, where, it once, where before you only had one. So the whole thing works beautifully in that you get uh, more light nuclei to which you can add neutrons, and so forth and so on. And this then, uh, these, this small amount, forms the seeds for S process nuclei in first generation stars. S process means the neutrons are captured slowly. Uh, much more slowly in stars uh, than in uh, uh, than in the early universe. Well, we can go on with this. Here's a proton-rich bubble in a neutron C. It turns out you don't want to use up your neutrons too soon, uh, and that's fine because it turns out the bubbles originally are uh, quite dense, and they have very little surface so you don't get much neutron penetration. Then as the expansion goes on, uh, the density in here gets lower, so neutrons aren't scattered so badly. The surface area gets greater, so the neutrons out here in the rich sea can, can come back in. And thank heavens that happens, because in these proton-rich bubbles, one of the things you make is beryllium-7. Beryllium-7 has four protons and three neutrons. That's the mass that you will get at mass, that's the nucleus you will get at mass 7 when you're in a neutron-rich region. Four neutrons compared to three protons. The stable form of mass 7 is lithium-7, which is three uh, uh, 
I bet I've said it wrong. Anyhow, lithium-7 is three protons and four neutrons. The beryllium-7 is four neutrons and three protons. So, uh, but the neutrons can come in. Turns out when, when Mulaney and I first did this, we had a terrible time because we made too much beryllium-7 here, and then after it was all over, the beryllium-7 decayed by electron capture uh, to lithium-7, so we made much too much lithium-7. The solution was this stage of the game where neutrons came in, uh, hit the beryllium-7, changed it into lithium-7 plus protons, but with the protons in there, the lithium-7 hit them and went to went to two helium nuclei, so you didn't wind up with too much lithium-7 and ultimately too much, lithium, too much beryllium-7 and ultimately too much lithium-7. And that's all stated there. Uh, because you see, the beryllium-7 survives. It has a half-life of 53 days, uh, by which time the universe is, I mean, is relatively old in this scale of things. Well, I'm not sure you can read this. Uh, one of the things that pleased me was that this inhomogeneous neutron-rich region required the study of uh, many additional nuclear reactions in the laboratory, which we didn't have any use for in the old homogeneous universe. So the inhomogeneous universe, the neutron-rich region, uh, brought the necessity for studying in the laboratory all the reactions that you can see here. You probably can't read it, uh, but you can see there are quite a few of them. And that has, uh, one of the things that pleased me most, that uh, some work that we were doing theoretically could lead to work to be done in the laboratory, uh, because by this time, work on stellar nucleosynthesis in the laboratory had pretty well petered out. And so this was a new shot in life for Bill Cavanaugh and Charlie Barnes and others in our laboratory and other places. Uh, if you plot against this omega or against the current baryon density, when you divide it by the critical density, you get omega. Uh, uh, in the old homogeneous universe, you got helium, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7 with the observed abundances when the, uh, uh, when the density was, uh, uh, see, uh, that's 10 to the minus 31, was about three times 10 to the minus 31. Well, that's much less than the critical density, which is way over here at six times 10 to the minus 30th, you see. So in the old point of view, uh, in a homogeneous universe, as many other people have found, the density of the universe, as measured from what went on in the early Big Bang, or just afterward, uh, was about one-tenth of the critical density. And so, uh, since we had come to believe that there was something that was making up the critical density, we had to do it with all kinds of exotic particles like neutrinos, photinos, axions, and uh, I never liked those things, so uh, uh, that partly motivated me to go to the uh, study uh, with the, uh, in the inhomogeneous universe. And there you have a lot of flexibility because you have a proton-rich region. You have a proton-rich region in which uh, you can make things. And you also have a neutron-rich region in which uh, one can make things. Here you see you start out with a lot of neutrons, and then they get captured or decay run down here. Up here it's mostly hydrogen being converted into helium, and the neutrons disappear at a very early stage of the game. Well, to make a long story short, uh, one of the nice things about this uh, model is that uh, you have some, uh, uh, some quantities you can play around with. One is the fraction of the volume uh, in the uh, uh, in the neutron rich region relative to the fraction of the volume in the proton rich region. Well, Mulaney and I, or I should say Mulaney, uh, used a computer to search for the best fits to things, 
and we found that uh, there's another constant you have. So that measures this back diffusion of neutrons into the proton-rich region. Uh, it's very difficult to calculate neutron diffusion. Uh, anyone who's in the field knows that. So all we did was say that uh, the ratio of the neutrons in the proton-rich region relative to the uh, neutrons in the neutron-rich region was the quantity A0. So it measures the back diffusion. A0 means you have very rapid diffusion. A0 equals 0 means no back diffusion. And it turns out that A0 greater than about 0.3, somewhere up in here, and uh, uh, gives quite good agreement with, uh, with the observations. Here are the observed limits here. Uh, the deuterium is greater than 5 times 10 to the minus 6. Well, we get something like, uh, like 10 to the minus 5 in this A0 equals 0.3, which is a line right through here. Uh, the helium-3 is 3 times 10 to the minus 5. Well, uh, uh, excuse me, where is it? Where is it? Oh, it's less than 3 times 10 to the minus 4. Well, we're down around 3 times 10 to the minus 5, 2 times 10, so we're less than 3 times 10 to the minus 4. The helium, this is where there it can be a lot of criticism. We make too much helium, 0.25. It depends on how serious you take uh, the people who think they can calculate the amount of, amount of helium-4. Uh, uh, when our galaxy started, uh, when I made this slide, there was a latitude in the observations. Now the number's been do tied down to 0.23, and so if that's the case, we're high. But uh, this is a very oversimplified calculation, and I'm still working on these things with postdocs in the Kellogg lab. We're trying to see if there isn't some way to get this calculated number down to a more reasonable value. And uh, in, the, in the large Magellanic cloud, lithium-7 uh, runs between 2 and 8 times 10 to the minus 10th. Well, up here at AC, equal to 0.13, we're, uh, we're just in that ballpark, you see. So in general, this uh, picture of nucleosynthesis in the inhomogeneous universe agrees fairly well with the observations, except for uh, the fact that too much helium-4 is made. And that's fun, because it leaves some, it leaves some more work to be done. So uh, just kind of to summarize here, uh, Big Bang nuclear synthesis of the heavy elements it all takes place in a neutron-rich sea. Uh, you, you go very easily up to O18 with neutrons, deuterons, tritium, alpha particles, helium-4. And then you have rapid neutron capture. And when you get up way all the way up, you get fission. So you get new seed nuclei. And it, oh, you know, fission gives you additional neutrons. Good old fission. You put one in, you get three out. And uh, so you can have fission cycling. And uh, we found that 25 cycles would do the trick. And that's another kind of arbitrary uh, number, but, uh, but a reasonable one. And so it produces the low heavy element abundances, about one ten thousandth of the solar found in the oldest stars in the galaxy. So our galaxy formed with small amount of heavy elements produced in the inhomogeneous Big Bang nucleus synthesis. Well, there are problems. Uh, the luminous matter, as was discussed yesterday, uh, which is the baryons that are luminous, uh, it looks like it's about one tenth of the critical density. And so it's less than omega zero equal to one. And the whole thing is, what is the dark or missing matter? Neutrinos, axions, shadow matter, and so forth. And of course, as I say, I think that it is baryons, but they have to be dark. And that's uh, one of the problems. The conventional, there's another problem. The conventional globular cluster ages are 16 billion years. 
Well, that's greater than RT0. I don't know whether I pointed it out to you there. It was around 10 to 11 billion years. Uh, one way you can get around reducing goblet cluster ages is to have main sequence mass uh, loss when the stars first form. And uh, that's been studied by Leanne Wilson at Iowa State. Also, Winget finds that the age of the oldest white dwarfs is less than RT0, so he's on our side. Well, the epitome is we may well live in the simplest of all Einstein's universes. His curvature parameter is zero. His cosmological constant is zero. His space-time is Euclidean. His universe has zero total energy, and his matter is stuff like us. I think Einstein would like that. I know I do, and I hope you do. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer questions if there are any. Hmm. I can't hear you. Oh, I see. All right. Now, let me get this thing. Oh, he's done it. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I made it. Interesting if true. Who the noise is this? Is that Samuel Johnson? Okay. Let me remind you if you have questions, you can send them to the aisle. The ushers will pick them up and bring them forward. We will start with uh, comments and questions from the panel. Uh, Professor Harrison? Uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, nice to, uh, to ask where things originated. And here is a quarter, and to ask uh, where did the metal come from? Now, uh, 
the the answer the answer has uh, has been that the this metal was made in a star that died before the birth of the sun that star exploded throughout the heavy elements into the interstellar medium uh, that then formed and made up our own star and our own planets. And so that's one of the exciting facts of the new picture of the universe, that uh, the, of this century rather, that, uh, uh, that uh, the we and things around us, uh, the elements were made, built up out of the death of old stars that, uh, before the birth of our sun. So, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the very early stage of the universe, which uh, uh, Professor Hoyle has been discussing, uh, the, uh, the, the idea was that the, the, the elements were the simplest. Hydrogen, and then came mainly helium, and so the first stars uh, consisted uh, mainly of hydrogen, helium, and then the heavy elements, according to the uh, the, uh, the the argument by uh, the Burbages, Fowler, and Hoyle, was that the heavy elements were then manufactured in stars. But now, today we heard of this uh, this uh, uh, new approach, and I want to ask uh, Professor Fowler how much of uh, the uh, the metal must I now attribute to, to the Big Bang rather than to the stars? One part in 10,000. Oh, one ten thousand. That will be that will be about a milligram, say. Oh no, a, a few few micrograms. Then. Yeah. And would those el would it cover the elements that uh, are common around us, the metals, the iron peak? Yes. All yeah. the metals. Well, it's a little special because you only make the neutron-rich isotopes of the heavy elements, but uh, uh, I forget about, I, I think silver would be okay. Yeah. I, I can now return See, the silver only has one to isotope, the chairman. Or is it two? How many isotopes does silver have? One or two, maybe two. Doesn't it's matter. It's all copper and nickel. There's not a iota of silver. <laughs> <laughs> Just like astrophysics. <laughs> Professor Ferris, um, you know, the, uh, one of the beautiful things about particle accelerators is that you can recreate conditions that existed at some point early in the history of the universe. And the bigger the accelerator, the earlier and hotter and higher energy epoch you can replicate to some degree in the accelerator. We're in a period now where Uh, can't, isn't it possible to argue that, well, you, you're you capable of reconstructing what may well have happened at different epochs beyond the reach of uh, even a very expensive grand accelerator. Well, so do we need the accelerator? Not for what I've been talking about. We don't need, uh, in fact, in, in this business, what you need is lower and lower energies because the temperature and density, especially in the stellar nuclear synthesis, uh, even the stuff I talked about, the uh, uh, I think the temperature corresponds to around 100 kilovolts or so. And uh, so uh, insofar as all of this is concerned, uh, we don't need a superconducting collider. And of course, uh, I uh, uh, am opposed to superconducting colliders. And, uh, and uh, one of the reasons is that they're not going to do me any good. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Morse. Yes, well, without uh, entering into a brief for expensive machines in Texas, uh, I would say that there is, you depend heavily upon the implications of these early phenomena. After all, the Witten 
inhomogeneity and the quark uh, hadron transition and so on is very nice and it's all done by the theorists, but it would be awfully nice to have some kind of touch of realism added by some experimental information. And I imagine they will try very hard in the next years to do something about quark matter. And I mean, uh, before it is made hadronic, in the, in the uh, infinitely transient situation that they can find with especially yes. large conductors. Yes, so it's right. not divorced from that. It is still the cosmological era. But uh, what Professor Fowler has done is show us that even in the sort of nuclear physics era, which is not cosmological in some grand sense, because it's accessible to our experiment directly, there's a possibility for novelty in the, in the discussion. Other questions? Oh, Professor Geller. Yes, I, well, Willie, I have to say that I'm one of those stupid people that you refer to uh, <laughs> in your lecture, uh, because I don't believe that omega is one. And um, the reason I don't believe omega is one is that when we measure, we look at the dynamics of systems of galaxies and we measure the masses of systems even on rather large scale, we never seem to come up with a number that large. And it's especially a problem if the matter is baryonic. Now, it's true that we can't limit matter which is uniformly distributed. On the other hand, if the matter were baryonic, you might expect it to cluster the way galaxies and other things cluster in the universe. So my question to you is, if this stuff is out there, where is it? And how do I go find it? Well, it cannot be in our galaxy. <laughs> That's uh, for the, sure. <laughs> the, the dynamics of our galaxy, as Oort showed many years ago, yes. requires only about twice as much as, as you fellows, yes. <laughs> as you ladies and gentlemen, uh, actually observe. I can be a fellow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that it isn't out there. Now, I, I guess I didn't, em I didn't have time to emphasize that enough. Uh, people who have uh, my point of view, we're in a little, little bit of a tough spot because, <laughs> because we can't put it into too large objects because, that, because then they'll shine. Yes. And you ladies and gentlemen would see them. Right. And, uh, and you better not let us detect and, them by uh, dynamical means. They better uh, not be in galaxies. Yeah, and if you, make them too, <laughs> if you make them too small like dust, uh, then they'll uh, they'll just obscure everything. Yeah. So we're uh, we're forced to say that the this uh, exotic matter, uh, but but which is baryons, is probably uh, on the average something about the size of the planet Jupiter, because in the in I claim that in the intergalactic medium you would not see Jupiter. But why, why wouldn't these Jupiters cluster together with clusters of galaxies and, and around, around individual galaxies? I mean, why wouldn't we detect them when we study the dynamics of large systems? You would expect that they would not remain uniformly distributed if they were... Oh, it could even be very much more... Well, I confess that's one of the problems, but uh, if you believe that nice agreement that we get and do explain these uh, observations that uh, that are made on the uh, on the uh, abundances in the very oldest stars uh, then uh, you've got to you've got to hide it but then that's got to be done in any point of view yes i mean there, unless, I agree, unless as you say you don't believe a make well, it's equal to one that's right i don't but believe but then but but then you can't but then believe I, you in know, inflation you know, well that's also true Inflation is a beautiful picture, but but it makes a prediction that omega is one, and, yes. and it's true that we can't rule that out. On the other hand, we don't find it, and it's getting harder and harder to understand why we don't find it. And and of course, omega you, you could have a non-zero cosmological constant, which is also not so pleasant. But uh, inflation does explain some things, but it doesn't it doesn't tell the whole story from the point of view of someone who's actually exploring the universe. Um, I mean, or from the, I mean, we have, one, one of the funny things in this field, of course, is that we have very few real observations. I mean, we, we hang our hats on a very small number of quite big, one of them is the abundance of the elements, another is that the sky is dark at night, uh, another is the structure that we observe, uh, and, but we don't have a huge number of, of things, and uh, so we're not, not as well constrained as we'd like to be, but I think we're, com we're, we're becoming better constrained by knowing something about 
uh, what at least the nearby universe looks like. I guess the, the, other, the other thing that people have suggested for explaining these heavy elements is that there was an early generation of massive stars which preceded galaxy formation and that these stars had rather short lifetimes and they produced, and in the supernovae, which were the end result, yeah. uh, they distributed heavy elements, which are what we observe. Now, of course, um, I guess you would say there are lots of problems with that model, which make yeah. it unpalatable. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But the other thing is that uh, uh, we can point out something for this space program to do with all that money it's spending. <laughs> when they get up there, uh, outside of the galaxy, go around and scoop, scoop up some of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. I'm serious. And, uh, and, uh, well, uh, well uh, I mean, they're going to spend it anyhow. And they might as well do something useful with it. And, uh, well, I think you should propose this mission. Uh, oh, I have. Oh, I have. Uh, it's the first intergalactic mission on the NASA yeah. roster. Professor Morrison. I'd like to ask a question, which is not as usual, a rhetorical question. It's a question I really don't know the answer to this question. I'd like to know what, what is the learning on this, and the two of you can probably enlighten me. The heavy element contamination in what are judged to be bold stars, old stars, has a something of a problem, it seems to me, in this sense. Those stars have been, you know, one inhomogeneous device is good, but maybe a second inhomogeneous device will make some trouble for it. It's all very well to separate the neutrons from the protons. Now I'm suggesting, suppose that the contamination of these poor old stars living in this dirty galaxy for all those five or eight billion years since they were around, got plated with some heavy material from the local situation and didn't, weren't born with that at all. The, no, the amount is so small that I don't think it affects the stellar interior and therefore it doesn't affect the the overall physiology of the stars, and it's quite hard to tell. It comes entirely from spectral analysis of the top gram or something like that of a star that is 100 million grams thick per square centimeter. So I wonder if that's been uh, looked into to see if the mixing is The stars have a convective layer. They do, but I don't know how But deep. it's not very deep. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not. well, I've looked into that. It's, it's, it's so deep that you've got to contaminate 2 or 3 percent of the, of the star's mass. Well, yeah, that look, may be. That's these still a big number. convective layers are... Well, Are I guess allowed for that possibility that no, it's just a contamination. I don't know it's my that. it's my understanding that the convective layers involve a, a, a substantial amount of the mass in the sun. It's a it's a it's a quite uh, large fraction, isn't it? In, in I don't really I don't I don't know. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm pretty sure but it's, I think it's, it's a, a pretty it's large a, fraction. It's an interesting in the sun. question, but I don't know the I don't know the answer either. You see, once the temperature gets low enough that you can't transfer energy by, uh, by, uh, by conduction, then you've got to use convection. And the sun's giving off, the sun and any other star is giving off this energy. It goes out a certain distance by conduction, and then the conduction ends, and then you've got to get rid of it. And the only way you can do is have the outer surface uh, convect, bring the energy from down deep up to the top where it can shine. One of the, I, I might, uh, just mentioned that one of the appealing things about the suggestion of population three is that you can you can sort of compute if you look at the voids in the galaxy distribution you can compute the energy input required to make them and it's not so different from what you need uh, to actually produce these heavy elements so some people have tried to make that connection between this population three as being uh, sources of explosions which might drive the large-scale structure we observe but th there are of course many problems with that as there are with all the explanations that that try to uh, explain how the structure we observe in the universe form, but there are there are these ideas that one of these problems might have something to do with the other. Which is sort of oh, I agree to that, but I've never liked population three because it's all gone, <laughs> and there's no way we can we can check up on what people are saying about population three. The thing that I'm proposing can be found, mm -hmm. and it's a it's an alternative. Yes, it's mm -hmm. a, that's if you want to. Mm -hmm. Put it simply, it's an mm -hmm. alternative to the population three point of view. If it's found mm -hmm. that in the intergalactic medium, there ain't any Jupiters or other things that can make up the uh, mm -hmm. so-called dark matter, 
then I give up and uh, I'll go back and work on something else at which I'll make great mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> like all the rest of us. <laughs> I, I, I'd just like to interject for the sake of those, who, uh, many of our listeners who are not in the field, that population three is a, a, a hypothesis of a generation right, of stars I earlier I than, the, that, than the yeah. stars. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I must have. <laughs> you went not to sleep. At all. You went to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> Professor McMullen. Yeah. This is a more general question. Um, the inflation model itself is just about 10 years old. And I think to the average person in the audience here, the notion of an expanding universe is already becoming somewhat familiar, but the notion of inflation is still, I think, hard to take. Uh, one is talking of an expansion here in the very much less than the first second of the Big Bang. Uh, in which you would go, let's say, from the size of a baseball to the size of the observable universe. That's one analogy I've seen used, which is in less than a second, which is close to instantaneous. Now, um, the question I have, a general one, is this. Does your work bring additional credibility to that idea, or is it simply a way of filling it in, drawing consequences, if we accept the inflation model, then the following would this would follow. For example, specifically, if you accept the inflation model, how plausible does it make these inhomogeneities on which your entire analysis depends? Well, first of all, you do have to have inflation, and then you have to have the additional uh, uh, thing that Witten at Princeton was the first one to point out, that after inflation, you just don't have a uniform universe any longer when it all settles down settles down into, um, into, um, into bubbles of matter in an otherwise vacuum. And then out of these bubbles, the neutrons diffuse out. And so pretty soon you have proton-rich bubbles in a neutron-rich sea. That's an oversimplified picture, of course, because in the calculations that Mulaney and I and others have done, we have to take the bubbles all the same size. And we, we describe the whole, that complicated situation that it must have been by two free parameters, this F sub B and the A zero that I had up there. And uh, it must have been, uh, but I, I, I think that, uh, that something like that uh, really had to happen. We, uh, you see, the, the fact that the, that the curvature constant is zero from other considerations is what the inflationary model uh, really gives you. Convinced that the curvature constant is zero, then the simplest explanation is an, er as I said, is an early great expansion which straightens out all the coordinate lines. Okay. Okay. So, so, in, well, let me go back yeah. to the original question. Perhaps, um, supposing you were to meet someone who are a little skeptical about the idea of inflation generally, would you? argue that your work on nucleosynthesis brings additional support to that, or would it simply be a matter logically of saying, if we accept inflation, then these are the results for nucleosynthesis that would follow? But would you see some indirect kind of support brought to the inflation hypothesis? Just like, for example, earlier, the figures on uh, helium abundance brought support to the Big Bang. Well, I don't know what... Uh I think it does support the general idea of inflation uh, because the inflationary epoch is essential, but in a complicated way. Uh, namely, after inflation, you have to have this idea of Witten's and, and uh, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the result was not a uh, uniform universe, but it was all these proton, all these matter-rich bubbles. And of course, uh, uh, the analogy that I, uh, you see there was a phase transition and uh, uh, the phase transition that we're all familiar with is the boiling of water. Well, now when you boil water, it doesn't all boil at once. I mean, you make bubbles. Now of course that we understand because the bubbles form around little impurities in the water. I don't know what the impurities are that made up, uh, but uh, you see what I mean? Uh, all Witten has to say, well, there was something 
like the impurities in boiling water that made the bubbles form instead of the whole, the whole thing boiling at once. Get it? It's a much more reasonable picture. And uh, all I, and I don't know whether what we have done uh, proves that, but it's in agreement with it. And it's in disagreement with the old point of view in which you can't make any, any heavy elements. And then, so then you have to make them in, in population three stars. And as I've, I guess, <laughs> said ad nauseum, I don't like population three stars because we don't see any remnants. Whereas the population. Also nobody knows how to make them, which is yeah, another minor yeah, problem. But, <laughs> but, but the standard population one and population two that we all learn about, they're there. They're there and uh, can be observed. Study and so the pop, but maybe maybe what we're doing is even more nonsense than population three. But uh, I hope not in the long run. Yeah, well, I don't like omega equals one because I think it isn't there. <laughs> <laughs> You're a difficult gal. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Professor Harrison. Uh, I I think it's a. Uh, misconception that inflation requires omega equal to one. And uh, I see no conflict between the two of you. Uh, if observation shows that omega is equal to point 0.1, you are talking of a phase transition uh, back uh, when uh, uh, the curvature constant in, in any case was effectively zero. No, but if, if, uh, and, if, and, and so... If you're absolutely right. And so there is no conflict between the two of you, provided you look into the theory and realize that inflation does not uh, unambiguously demand that omega is now equal to one. You're right. That no, is a true. simplification that's certainly true, but then you for, have the for the sake of popularity of the subject. Yes, but, but it does require that k be zero. That's right. Well, it, it, we know that whatever you, uh, you are going to say k is now the curvature constant, effectively during the early universe, it's swapped so you can put it equal to zero. Well, inflation certainly does. <laughs> With, even without inflation, it's effectively uh, no, zero. No, I don't believe that at all. We have a question from the audience. Would you explain the relation between the false vacuum and the initial bang? <laughs> Is that? Well, the, uh, uh, the false vacuum uh, is all the surrounding stuff. Uh, it has the it has the remarkable property that it, that it generates a negative pressure. So when you add up rho c squared, where rho is the matter density, uh, plus the, the vacuum density, uh, the pressure due to those two, uh, uh, can, so you have to, to get the total energy, you, you, you have rho c squared plus the pressure. We forget about that usually in classical physics, but there it is. And so that's equal to zero, and I like that because that means that the early universe energy was conserved. And for people who've worked in nuclear laboratories, that's, that's kind of a thing that you just have to have in order to be happy with what's going on. Another question which relates to one of the comments from yeah. the panel. Uh, how does your model develop proton bubbles in a universe that should be extremely homogeneous following the inflation? Well, that's just, a, that's just an oversimplification. You're already making things complicated by having two, uh, by having the bubbles in a, in a, in a vacuum. And sure, you can make the, uh, you can make the scenario as complicated as you want, but then you can't make any calculations without uh, really 
mean hiding things in a computer in such a way that you don't really know what's going on. So we have adopted a very oversimplified picture of what the universe was like after the quark-hadron phase transition. Uh, but if you make it any more complicated, then you can't make simple calculations. And whether some of you like it or not, that's a thing we do all the time in physics. We simplify complicated problems in order to, to be able to solve them. Isn't that right, Phil? Yeah. And often we don't solve them. <laughs> yes, even after we simplify them. <laughs> Another question uh, from the audience for the entire panel. Uh, all of the Big Bang and steady state as well as uh, Margaret Geller's galaxy mapping depends on the Hubble law using the redshift as a measure of cosmic distance. ARP and his group have presented evidence that this interpretation is not correct. Would you care to comment on that? ARP's uh, arguments are incorrect. <laughs> I think there's abundant evidence. There was a long period when there was really a controversy about whether the redshift was <coughs> really uh, related to the distance as suggested by the Hubble law. And I think recently there have been many observations on large scales uh, which indicate uh, that, that that is correct. One of the, one of, perhaps one of the most striking is the observation of gravitational lensing where you see a distant source, gravity, bends light, so it acts like a funny kind of lens. And we see distant quasars, which are lensed by intervening galaxies. And models can be made for these, which assume that the redshift is an accurate measure of the distance. And these scales are very large. And these models are tested very accurately, because the data, often you have radio maps of these, which are extremely accurate. And it's remarkable, in fact, how accurately the models match the data. So I think this is one of the cleanest pieces of evidence, which is recent. Another is that one of the reasons that people doubted that the redshift was a measure of distance is that quasars, which are very distant objects which appear stellar, uh, have, they have a prodigious energy input if you use the redshift to compute the distance. However, and people couldn't see, now people believe that quasars live in galaxies and in fact people have uh, seen the galaxies associated at the same redshift with quasars. Also, there are galaxies along the line of sight to quasars which absorb light, and you can find the galaxy at the redshift which is associated with the absorption line. Uh, more direct confrontation with ARP is that ARP makes certain statistical arguments, and these have been looked at in, in detail uh, by people who have made uh, much better maps of the universe and of the distribution of quasars and galaxies in the universe than were observed before, and it turns out that our uh, statistical arguments are fallacious. So I think that although there was a controversy, uh, it's, I think, now really uh, not a, a, a real issue. A little personal story. Many, many years ago, uh, I had a class in nuclear astrophysics, and of the students, one was Halton Arp, and the other was Alan Sandage. And of course, Sandage has done some remarkable work in extending Hubble's early work. And by the way, he's just been awarded the, the Crayford uh, uh, Prize, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, and so, in the exams and everything, Sandy just sailed through the course, and I, of course, gave him an A. Well, ARP did not solve one problem. <laughs> and, uh, oh, but I liked him. <laughs> And so I thought, well, I won't give him an F, because then he'd have to take the course over, and I couldn't stand that. <laughs> and uh, then I thought, well, maybe I'll give him a D. But if I gave him a D, then he didn't get any credit at all. So 
uh, I finally gave him, what would you guess? A C minus. <laughs> and I've always been glad that I did so. <laughs> Professor Ferris. Um, Einstein used to say in words that are engraved here and there over a uh, fireplace in Princeton, for one, that uh, the Lord is subtle but not malicious. Um, another way to say this is that it it is possible to concoct a more complicated but alternate explanation for any phenomenon observed in nature. You can theorize that, well, I'll give you a better example, when uh, geological strata were first discovered, uh, religious fundamentalists argued against them on the grounds that God had deposited this evidence to make it look as if the world were older than the Bible said to test the faith of those who might be tempted to disbelieve the Bible by looking, well, that's a malicious act on the part of God. It's like that, that, what Einstein was saying was God doesn't work that way. The, if we assume that the redshifts of galaxies are due to actual velocity, then everything fits in a very simple way, and we see redshifts in light that are indubitably due to velocity uh, in, in the nearby universe. One can construct an alternate theory that says, well, there's another mechanism that makes the galaxies act just as if the universe were expanding. Uh, and it's possible to do that, but it requires a, a malicious sort of construction to the universe to do it. So for, for Chip Arp to be correct, God must be more malicious than uh, I think the evidence shows. In 1929, when uh, Hubble uh, presented uh, uh, the distance measurements and the redshift measurements showing that they, they had a relationship that later became known as Hubble's Law and forms the uh, foundation of our, 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 our belief that the universe is expanding. In that same year, in the same volume and in the same journal, uh, Zwicky uh, uh, wrote a, a different paper uh, proposing what is called the tired light theory uh, to explain the redshifts and uh, arguing that perhaps the universe doesn't expand at all, but as light travels these vast distances uh, in the universe, it grows tired. And, and this is just a, a sort of an expression he offered no physical explanation, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, in the intervening years there have been many, uh, many arguments, physical, uh, physical theories, to try and uh, make sense of this idea that uh, light grows tired as it travels uh, over large periods of time in a static universe. And, uh, the, there are problems. We, the, commonly, the idea is that there is uh, some medium throughout the universe uh, that robs the radiation of its energy as it travels. Uh, but this medium's got to be very peculiar. It's got to not. It's got to take the energy away without scattering the light. And there is no known uh, interaction between radiation and matter that can achieve exactly this effect. So it would be a, whatever it is, it, would, it seems that it's highly contrived, and it would be a jest, not by God, but by nature, if uh, indeed that, uh, that tired light theory turned out to be correct. Well, it's also demonstrably inconsistent. Yeah, right? you're right. There, there's self-consistent, the, 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 the no, it, makes fact, it makes the, predictions the, about how surface the, brightness the, of galaxies should depend on redshift and how the angular size should depend on redshift, and those are demonstrably inconsistent with that. Yeah, the, 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 the current belief fits together beautifully in a self-consistent fashion with many other observations. So, uh, it's, I think it's quite secure. Although still we see, uh, see proposals about the tired light theory. It doesn't die. We have one final question. Before that, I want to remind you that the afternoon session begins at 1.30 for Professor Gellick's lecture. The last question, I think, is loaded. It says, who's going to win the World Series? Uh, 
I know the answer. I, I figure it's from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you this afternoon. That's it.